حاضر بلا ان شیطان رجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اس لئے حاضر کنین حنیف جاکورا حبو بکر دستنگویش لیڈیز ان جنرلمن اسلام علیکم و رحمت آئی برکاتہ I am indeed honored by the invitation to come and say a few words on this very important event. I thank you for that. The theme of today is entrepreneurship changing the mindset. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk to you about. All of us, and if I may, speak to you from the heart. All of us are high achieving individuals desiring success in this world. But really, have we spent time to sit down and define what is success? And is success necessarily the same for everyone? I see success is something that's very personal. You have to decide what it is that pleases you or would make you happy. And then, from there, you distill what would be the, the key performance indicators which would spell success for you. I'd like you to try to delve in a little bit more into the concept of success. And I'd like you to imagine two different scenes. The first scene is that film of Will Smith in which he was in New York and he was the only person in the whole city. Just try to imagine yourself in a city and you're all alone. Now tell me, what are the value of the assets in, in that city? You can go and take any building you want. You can go where you want. But you're entirely alone. So there's no value in those assets. So what creates value? What creates value is people. And it's people who create demand. And from demand, you get value. Somebody wants to buy, somebody wants to sell, somebody desires, prepare to pay a price. So we realize that it's not assets that are important, it's people that are important. Along with that, we realize that success is also related to people in a different way. It's that people recognize you as being successful. If you're alone, what good is recognition? Now let me give you a second scene. The second scene is now you're 100 years old. Okay? I can assure you at 100, you'll be very lonely. Because most people that you've known have passed away. You're sitting there and you realize that you might have been a tower of strength in your younger years, but at the age of 100, you're a liability. It doesn't matter what your background is. So as you sit there and you see your family who are much younger, who are going about their businesses and their responsibilities, you are left all alone. So how do you face yourself? How do you spend the time? You realize therefore, that you've only got your legacy to fall back on. What have you left behind? What are your contributions? What were your factors of success when you were young and have those factors of success changed with time? Are you at peace with yourself? Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are very hard realities. We're all going to grow old, and we're all going to die. That is 
a certain fact. So we've got to think about what type of legacy are we going to leave behind us. So it's very important that in our day-to-day -day activities, in trying to achieve success, we don't lose sight of the long term. If you can understand that, if you can actually adopt it today, then I think this conference would have achieved its objectives of changing the mindset. And you find that when you have that long-term orientation, your frame of reference changes. You start to think, what am I doing today? And how does it contribute to my success or to my legacy? Oliver Wendell Holmes said, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. So we realize that success is not only recognition of people or the fact that you may have achieved certain pinnacles of, of, of performance. It's also success with yourself, your inside. And that is absolutely vital. It's absolutely important you realize that you've got to build yourself within as much as you've got to build yourself without. For that is what ensures integrity. The integrity of the personality. The oneness of, a, of an individual. We realize, therefore, that time is a very important element. And we also realize that in trying to be successful, the environment is also very important. So when we realize that our success factors are critically influenced by time and environment, we need to pay a little bit of attention to analyzing in what environment are we performing. In the global rankings of the World Economic Forum, Pakistan ranks as 117th in, the, in board efficacy, 91st for reliance on professional management, and 86th in terms of willingness to dedicate authority. I think these three indicators taken together clearly paint a picture of where we as a nation stand. What's our problem today? Our problem is the fact that Pakistani business competes in an environment suffering from the lowest levels of intellectual and skills capacity globally. And yet we know, it's so self-evident, that success is related entirely to the people that we associate with. And if those people are ranked at the bottom of the ladder, then you've got to ask yourself the question, what type of environment are you actually competing in? In my opinion, the true foundation for success is that you concentrate on both building the outside as building within. The within is your character. As Theodore Roosevelt said, character in the long run is the decisive factor in the life of an individual and of nations alike. Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the supreme quality of leadership is unquestionable integrity. Without it, no real success is possible. Mahatma Gandhi said, one cannot do right in one department of life while we are occupied in doing wrong in any other department. Life is one indivisible whole. So ladies and gentlemen, the mindset is what we're talking about. The mindset is how do I achieve harmony between what's on my inside and what's on my outside? How do I integrate the two? And if you integrate the two, you will become transparent. 
And I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, this is the ultimate struggle. Because when you're 100, that's what you're going to be reflecting on. Now, what is going on within our country today? In our country today, we have some significant challenges. I think all of us know, are very familiar with, the importance of governance. The importance of good governance and transparency. Yet the sad fact is that if we were to look at where we stand globally, we do not earn any respect in the global community of nations. I think we can rise to the occasion. I think it is possible for us to take leadership and drag ourselves out of this difficult circumstance that we are currently placed in. But what will be required for that? What will be required is that first we need to have the will, the desire to want to do that. Secondly, we need to have the patience and the courage to change ourselves, to improve ourselves. I'm absolutely convinced that one of the most outstanding challenges we have today is a lack of education within our beloved nation. If you look carefully, over the last 40 years, there has been a persistent decline in what I refer to as our national intellectual capacity. Persistent decline. And if your manpower or your skills and intellectual capacity is not there, you will not be able to grow. Your success will be severely limited. Yet the strange thing is that the very institutions which are to create that are almost absent from our country. If you compare ourselves and our universities on a global scale, we don't even appear anywhere. So we've got to realize that we've got responsibilities far beyond the immediacy, which is how can I be, quote, successful, unquote, in terms of wealth creation. I honestly believe that if all of us, in our own way, collaborate with each other, civil society, we will be able to take initiatives which, if we have a long-term vision, will produce dramatic results. For too long, our country has concentrated on short-term solutions. Whether it be people in government, whether it be the army, whether it be the bureaucracy, whether it be civil society, whether it be our friends who, or those who claim to be our friends in the international community, everybody is seized with the short term. And why? Because everybody is there for a short period of time. So they want success while they're there, and then they move on to other opportunities. And for 60 years, we have been doing short-term solutions, thinking, probably fervently believing, that the sum total of these short-term solutions is a long-term solution. Well, the proof of the pudding is in eating. Pakistan has been doing short-term solutions for 60 years, and where are we today? Have we got a long-term solution? The answer is no. We're nowhere close to it. So we've got to. Civil society is going to have to take the initiative. And what is the strength of civil society? The strength of civil society is intellectual power. The strength of civil society is financial capability. But are we working together? No, we are not. We're not working together because we're all short-term oriented. 
We're not thinking long term. Ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely convinced that if you want to be a respected nation, now let's be let's call a spade a spade. Would you say that you going abroad, saying you're a Pakistani, that Pakistan is a value addition to you? It is not. Doesn't that hurt? Hurts terribly. Why don't we work together to make Pakistan a value addition to us? So we can proudly hold our heads up anywhere in the community of nations and say, yes, I'm a Pakistani. I'm proud to be so. But you need to realize that throughout the world, those nations are respected not because they had a lot of money, it's because they developed the intellectual capacity. How many nations are there that we know who got tons of money, tons of wealth? Are they respected? No. And yet you look at those nations, which may not be economically very rich, but intellectually, they're right at the top. And we look up to them. And so it is the same for us. It's very important that we realize that we need to develop our intellectual capacity in this country. For too long it has been declining. We need to establish those, elite, those intellectual elitist schools of learning without which, ladies and gentlemen, we have no hope. We need to understand it's going to be a long-term process. But we need to have the courage and the determination to commit ourselves to that course. For nobody else is doing it. And I believe the civil society can. And it's my privilege to tell you that a group of us got together to do just that. We recognized that these challenges were there in society. So a group of us got together and said, let us establish an intellectual elitist school of learning. And if we can produce those master trainers, we hope that those master trainers will go into society and start to have a exponential impact on the young. So we decided to set up a business school here. And firstly, we went out and found ourselves what is known as a globally recognized partner. And that was Cambridge University. And when I went to Cambridge and asked them to have a collaboration agreement with us, the dean asked me a question. It was on 13th of October 2008. He said, Hussein, setting up a new business school is not exciting. Cambridge making some money is not exciting. What makes your business school exciting? I knew at that moment in time that my answer was going to make all the difference in the world whether we we're going to succeed or we we're going to fail in getting Cambridge on board. So I said to him, I said, honored, I can answer that in one sentence. I said, we're going to take education to scale. So he said, how? I said, our country is not flushed with cash. Our country has a very low commitment to education. So we civil society are going to have to address that. Yes, we don't have taxing powers. Fine. But we're going to find a way to do this. So he asked me further, how are you going to do that? I said, what we're going to try to do is set up this business school and this business school would do two things fundamentally. First, it's going to teach people ethics and integrity. We're going to form the foundation of the school is going to be ethics and integrity. You want to come to this school, that's what we're going to teach you. It was not long ago that people felt that leadership and management couldn't be uh, taught. And yet today we're teaching it. 
So why can't we teach integrity? I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, we can. On the foundation of integrity, we want to build a superstructure of competence. And so we're going to give an MBA. But it's not going to be an MBA of the type where somebody comes in and says, I want to go into Goldman Sachs, or I want to go into Merrill Lynch and make myself a bundle of money. He can, or she can. But that is not our orientation. Our orientation is that we're hoping that the graduates of this institution will be outstanding people, both intellectually and from the point of view of character. Reliable, honest, upright with an unquestionable, inviolable commitment to a life based on integrity. These people, hopefully, we will encourage to go into education. And we're going to turn around and try to support them so that they're able to go into schools, into private education. And if you get each one of these individuals to impact 500 lives, the children in that school, that's how we go to scale. And it is our intent to try to graduate 400 students of that caliber per year. And if we can get half of them to go into education, there's 200 of them, multiply by 500 per school, we start to impact 100,000 lives a year. And you know, at that young age, that's the time when you can instill within those young minds a belief that leading a life based on integrity is the best way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the most important asset you have is called reputation. Reputation will get open every door for you. Money will not. Reputation will. And reputation comes because you make an inviolable commitment to integrity. Because all of us work on the concept of chemistry. When we meet people, there's a chemistry. And we learn to either trust or not trust based on what we feel. So this school, if we can get those 200 people to go into school, into Primary education, we start to impact 100,000 lives a year. And ladies and gentlemen, in the 10 years, that'll be a million lives. And I think that'll start to impact very positively on Pakistan's society and Pakistan's future and Pakistan's global image. And it's only 10 years, not very long. But at this moment in time, very urgent. This is what we're trying to do in the Karachi School for Business and Leadership. We say that we are interested in every single person coming on board. Please, it's your institution. It's a national institution. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's going to be an institution which sets standards, standards of transparency and good governance in which the foundation of its performance will be integrity and ethics. And ladies and gentlemen, I've gone through this experience. If you have doubts in your mind, that can you, can you really lead a life like this in a country like Pakistan? Pakistan is not the only country that's uh, suffering corruption. But in this environment, can you do it? My answer to you is a very emphatic yes. And I have it both in business and in not-for-profit. For example, the Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund, which started just 10 years ago, has in 10 years been able to raise $1 billion. How did it start? Because those who gave the money believed in those who were doing the job. For no other reason, 
And today, the Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund has contributed to the lives of some 20 million people. So if that can happen, and the strange thing about the Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund is that it's 100% government-owned. It's the only unique institution in which the government is 100% owner and has no say. It's 100% private sector managed. See, I would set an example. It's in front of you. So what I'm talking to you about is not something which is theoretical. I don't want to talk to you about the business side because people may think I'm trying to blow a trumpet, which I'm not. But I think you've seen the performance of Engro. Why is that possible? Because we have always emphasized the importance of doing business based on an ethical foundation. The net result is that, you know, the Creator blesses you. And you get opportunities that come so fast and on not a single occasion have we ever, ever gone out and been accosted that we should look after someone. We just won't do that type of business. Because those are our values, those are our principles. We will not do it. And therefore, people come to us because they say, this is a party that we can rely on. This is a party that we can trust. So these are not theoretical concepts. This school is not working on theory. It's working on hard-nosed experience. Imagine in your own minds that if you had one of these graduates, you employed, male or female, and you knew that that individual had Competence, but on the foundation of integrity, don't you think you'd just multiply yourself? It's axiomatic, it's self evident. All of us look for those type of people. Do we find them? The answer is no. Why do we find them? Because there's no institutions that produces them, no institutions concerned with them. What happened in the, in the global economy? The financial tsunami that took place. What's the foundation of that? Greed. Jute. Taking mortgages and repackaging them. And trying to get a, a, a rating which is entirely fictitious. And then selling them on to people. When you become one of the Hopefully, the graduates of this school would never countenance such an approach. They could never go out and willingly cheat people, even if it is within the framework of law. Ladies and gentlemen, let us rise to the occasion, to the challenge. Let us get together and put our hearts and souls into this. This school requires five types of capital, financial, Intellectual, reputational, networking, and spiritual. If you can't do anything for us, pray for our success. Thank you very much indeed.